Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. How many of you brought a copy of the Word of God with you this morning? Hold it up. Now just wave it at the devil. He can't stand that word right there. I heard about an, air, um, uh, an astronaut who was getting ready for his first inaugural flight into space and uh, a reporter came while he was just had sat down in, in the cockpit of that missile and uh, she, she interviewed him and she said, well, how are you feeling right now? And he looked back at her with a smile on his face and said, well, how would you feel if you were sitting on 50,000 parts that were assembled at the lowest bidder? Can I just tell you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, the word of God was not assembled by the lowest bidder, but by the Lord God, and you can count on it for the rest of your life. I'm glad for the word of God. I want you to hold on to your seats a little bit this morning because you would think, you know, pastor, you've been gone for a while. You've had some issues you've had to deal with, all this kind of, and we thought maybe when you got back, that you'd just make us feel good about ourselves and uh, we'd have a little sweet time together and praise the Lord and we'd go home. But you know the word of God uh, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and those of you been with me a few years, you know I don't back off from it. And we're approaching one of those scripture passages this morning uh, that is probably the strongest warning in all of the 66 books of the Bible. I'm going to ask you this morning to just think about yourself for a second. Are you really in Christ? And is Christ really in you? Have you really been born again? Has your life been radically changed by the grace of God? Now, I'm not talking about a church membership. I'm not talking about being baptized. Uh, I'm talking about salvation. Do you really know Christ? The Bible differentiates between those that do and those that don't. The writer today in Hebrews chapter number 10 is talking about the characteristics really of an apostate. I've heard that word a number of years ago as it was related to a friend of mine. And I've thought about it and I've labored over it for a number of years. The writer today is writing to the Jewish believers. As he's writing, it becomes painfully aware that about 80% of them are real believers And he's warning them, don't you go back into that old way of life. Don't you go back into Judaism. You stay in this grace that you have discovered in Christ. But in writing, he discovers that about 20% of those that claim to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior really don't know him. They know about him and they believe about him. They believe that he was the Son of God. They believed that he died on the cross for their sins. They believed and had a head knowledge of the things of the cross, but they didn't know Jesus. The term that is applied to that is the term apostate. I want to talk to you this morning about the composition, first of all, the composition of apostasy. What does it really, really mean? I guess we need to look at the text, if you will, uh, in chapter number 10, beginning in verse number 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy, under two or three witnesses, of how much more, how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall ye be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, 
and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. I'll stop there and we'll pick up the rest of it uh, in a few minutes. Let's look for a minute at the composition of apostasy. What does apostasy mean? Now an apostate is a person who hears the gospel, who understands the gospel, who grasps the meaning of the message of the cross. It, he understands that there is one sacrifice that was offered for all of the sins of the world and his name is Jesus. They understand that. They know it and they receive it in their brain and have a head knowledge of all of it. But they really never commit themselves to the message of the gospel. The writer says, when you reject the truth, then there remains no more sacrifice for that sin. Now, uh, it, they, they appear to sign on. These people appear to buy into it. They appear to commit to it. But the first time some persecution arises, first time that something gets real uncomfortable, the first time maybe that they experience some prosperity, all of a sudden, they're out of there. It smokes them out. It reveals them for who and for what they really are. First John chapter number two and verse 19, the Bible says they went out from us because they were not of us. And if they had been of us, they would have never left to begin with. Powerful truth here in the word of God. I'll give you an example. Saul in the Old Testament, an apostate, he had all of the right language. He had all of the right lingo. He had all of the right terminology. But you know what God said? God said, I, I regret the day that I ever let you become king. Judas in the New Testament would be considered an apostate. He was three years with the Lord Jesus. He sunk his whole life into those three years. He had all of the appearances that he was a true disciple of the Lord, but as it turns out, he sold the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus talking to Pilate, he said, let me, you know, let me just tell you, Pilate, you may be getting ready to sentence me to death, but the one who sold me out has a far greater punishment on his sin than you do. He was an apostate. Apostate is, a, is not, I'll say it real loud here, an apostate is not a real believer. They may appear to be a real believer. They may come to church. They may give their offering. They may serve in some capacity in the fellowship, but they are not true believers. I, I've often thought, how good it might be to have a, an apostate. You, you know those things you go through at the airport and, and those screening things that you go through and they reveal if you've got any metal in your pocket? My, my wife triggers those things every time we fly anywhere. It's going to go off and they're, they're, they're going to take that wand and just make sure. It'd be good maybe to have one at the front door of the church. Maybe an apostate detector. But... I'm glad we don't have the ability to detect apostates because there'd be a lot of apostate detectors running around trying to determine who's good and who's not and who's real and who's not. So he doesn't give us that. Only God knows that person. The Bible says to leave them alone because once they say no to the sacrificial work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says there remains no more sacrifice. There's no hope left. They are shut out when they refuse God's last offer of salvation. It's over. It's done. Now, when you study the Old Testament, you will discover that God differentiated between intentional sin and unintentional sin. He, he, he differentiated those two things. Apostates are into deliberate, intentional, purposeful sin and practice sin as a lifestyle. On the other hand, a true believer may occasionally backslide. But when that true believer occasionally backslides, there is a stab in the heart and, I, I, and suddenly he says, wait a minute, 
Why did I do, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. How could I let myself do such a thing as this? And immediately confesses and wants to get back right with God. That's not what we're talking about here in this passage though. The Bible says that under the law, there was not a sacrifice for an intentional sinner. Now hold your spot right here and go with me to Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15, and, and I want you to see verse 22 with me. Numbers chapter 15, verse 22. And if you have uh, erred and not observed all these commandments which the Lord hath spoken unto Moses, even all that the Lord hath commanded you by the hand of Moses from the day that the Lord commanded Moses and henceforward among your generations, then it shall be, it ought be committed by ignorance. In other words, you unintentionally messed up. Now, notice what he says there. Without the knowledge of the congregation that all the congregation shall offer one bullet for a burn. In other words, if you unintentionally do something then there is the ability for you to offer up a sacrifice to get the forgiveness for that sin with a meat offering, drink offering according to the manner and one kid of the goats for a sin offering. Now going down to verse 30. But the soul that doth ought presumptuously, in other words, intentionally, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord and that soul shall be cut off from among his people because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment. That soul shall utterly be cut off and his iniquity shall be upon him. God says if there's some unintentional sin, then there is the ability for the sacrifice. But if that person intentionally rejects and disobeys, then there is no sacrifice. Now, we, 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 we hear that from the law of God. And he said, that person who intentionally does it will be cut off from Israel forever. By the same token, when we get to talking about under grace and through the cross, when a person understands and comes to the full knowledge and awareness and says no or yes deceptively, there now remains no longer the ability for that person to ever be saved. He's talking really here about um, the unpardonable sin if you want to get down to the ne brass necks of, of this thing. You, you understand apostasy is always found out. People go along and they're pretending to be a Christian. They're pretending to know the Lord, pretending to have a relationship with him. But then persecution arises temptation sets in, prosperity occurs, and they're smoked out and revealed, and they are shown and displayed for who they really are. And then they get mad at God and everybody else around them that is trying to bring them to a place of knowledge with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says those who are enduring to the very end, they are really God's people. Now, let me give you, and this is kind of part and parcel of the same thing, but let me give you the consequences of apostasy. We, we looked at a second ago here at uh, some of the characteristics. Look at the consequences of apostasy. And, and there's seven of them that are listed here in the Word of God, and I'm going to go real quickly with you. The first one is this, there remains no sacrifice for the sin. You found that in verse 26. Watch this in verse 27. There's a second one, judgment and fire. Now, now we're back in uh, uh, back in in Hebrews now in the in the tenth chapter, and we're in verse twenty seven. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now he's not talking about the backsliders here. He he he's not talking about them at all. But he is talking about those who outwardly signed on and now have become enemies of God. He's talking here about the result of hell itself. Now I want to tell you, when I'm preaching this kind of sermon, it's not very popular in most congregations that you're going to go to in America today. As a matter of fact, 
over 50% of those that are on the church rolls today in this country don't even believe in hell. They don't want to hear about it. They believe in heaven, but they don't believe in hell. I, I just got a word. You better check with the word. You better check to see what the word says. Very clear, very plain. Let me give you the third. The Bible says that that apostate always tramples the son of God underfoot. Watch verse 29, if you will. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. He, he's referring back now to that passage in Numbers that we just read a few minutes ago. He says, if that's the way God dealt with them back then, how much more then is he going to deal with those who trample underfoot, who walk on Jesus today? Now, the, the fourth one is they treat the blood covenant as unholy. Uh, go on in verse 29, hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. It's the only remedy. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been singing about it all morning long. The blood of Jesus is the only remedy that you and I have for sin. If you were in India and you got bitten by uh, one of those cobras, you have only a short period of time uh, to really reverse the effects that are going to bring about imminent death. If a courier comes uh, to your hotel room there in India with the, the, the serum that is going to take care of the venom in your body, wouldn't you say, yes, I, I want that? But yet there are people today that are still saying no to the very and only remedy that we have for sin, the blood of Jesus. Now, number five, it insults the grace of God. The latter part of verse 29 an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. In, it, it insults the spirit of grace. He's talking here about the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit has two functions in the life of an unbeliever. First of all, the Holy Spirit convicts people of sin. You know, I have people tell me every once in a while, boy, you stepped all over my toes today. You walked all over my feet today. No, I didn't. I don't have the ability. No preacher has the ability to convict anybody of sin. But it's the job of the Holy Spirit to convict sin. Now, the second job of the Holy Spirit is to present truth to the unbeliever of the gospel. And if we cut off, if we reject, if we blaspheme, if we insult, if we push away that Holy Spirit who comes to convict us and to woo us and to expose truth to us, then we have cut off the only means of salvation. And the Bible says there remains no sacrifice of sins. Now, no, the sixth thing is retribution. Watch this in verse 30. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, I will repay, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. May I tell you, one of these days, the Lord's going to come and I'm looking for him. Somebody asked me yesterday, preacher, are you you're looking for Jesus today? I said, absolutely. I look for him every day to come back. I believe he's coming. And one of these days, he is going to come and he will confront those that rejected his offer of salvation. And the Bible says that he will cast them into the lake of fire. He's coming. The retribution. And then watch this last one. It's a life of dreadful fear in verse 31. It is a fearful thing mm, to fall into the hands of a living God. Now the writer then begins to turn. He turns his attention away from the unbelievers and he turns his attention now to the believers. I want to share with you third the co courageous convictions that need to be ours. Watch this in verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. He's talking about genuine, bona fide, real children of God. Christians, if you will. They didn't just received the knowledge of Jesus. They received Jesus, and there is a big difference. 
a big difference. The Bible says they endured a great fight of afflictions. You stood your ground. You stood pat. You speak the truth, but you speak the truth in love. Whether you are on your job or whether you're in your family or whether you're in the marketplace or whether you're at school, you stand firm on the convictions of the word of Almighty God and you don't cave in, you don't whip out. When somebody challenges your faith, you stand strong in the midst of it. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I tell you, it's, it's high time, in my opinion, it is high time that the people of God quit cowering down to the pressures of this culture that's trying to dictate what is right and what is wrong. When the word of God says it's wrong, we need to stand on, when the styles change, when the culture shifts, the word of God remains the same and the pure, unadulterated, inspired, infallible word of God should stead, be steadfast in our hearts and in our behavior. God's looking for people who go the distance. God's looking for people who will pay the price. God's looking for people who mean business and won't wimp out when a little bit of pressure comes their way. Look at verse 33. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so you. In other words, he's talking about being publicly exposed to insults and persecutions and other times of afflictions. You stood by the side of them who were being publicly put down. You know, it's one thing to stand for yourself, but it's another when you stand with somebody else. And, and he's talking about that very thing. Watch verse 34. For you had compassion of me and my bonds and took Watch this next little phrase. Took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Mm, wow. Powerful words that are right there. Not, not, not only did you stand your ground, but you were extending sympathy to those that were also suffering and going through these struggles. You, you took joyfully, he says. That's a powerful, powerful word. Powerful word. You took joyfully when you saw that your possessions were and your property was being taken away from you and confiscated and you smiled while they hauled it off. You know why they were able to do that? because they weren't holding on to their stuff too tightly. Well, I want to tell you what, folks. If our culture, our generation, if Christendom today is doing anything, it's holding on to stuff way too tight. We, we fill up our attics and our garages. We fill up our houses with a bunch of stuff that we absolutely don't need. And, and suddenly we decide, hey, I, I got to get rid. We'll have a garage sale and we'll sell it at a garage. Six weeks later, we're buying the same stuff back at somebody else's garage sale. Holding on to stuff. I, I used to go to Parade of Homes. Did y'all ever go to those things? Some of the open houses of new homes. Y'all ever go and you, you listen to, oh, I wish I had that. Oh, that, that, that media room, if I could just get me one of those in my house and da da da. I quit going to that mess. I, I really do. You know why? Because that's going to be a rotten doghouse compared to what God has in store for us when we get into glory. Not even comparing. Let me give you the last and we'll close. It's to contain confidence. Watch this in verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. What is our confidence? It's not in us. I wouldn't give you a half a hallelujah for self-confidence. I want Jesus' confidence. I don't trust in self. I don't want that kind of confidence. I want Jesus' confidence. I want the confidence in Christ when he says, 
If I come to him, he's going to make a new creation out of me. Old things are going to pass away and everything is going to become new. I want the confidence that I know for absolutely certain that all my sins have been forgiven. I want the Jesus confidence that gives me one of these days I'm going to walk on streets of gold and I'm going to walk through that gate of pearl into heaven with the Lord. I want the confidence that is worth living here in this life. Look at verse 36. For we have need of patience that after we have done the will of God, we might receive the promise. What's he talking about here? You see, that's the hope that every one of us have. Revelation 22 and verse 12, the Bible says, I am coming and my reward is with me. I'm coming and my reward is... You know, some of you have been working at your jobs for a long, long time. And when you got ready to retire, they didn't even give you a... They, they didn't give you the watches anymore. They just kind of told you what time it was. Some, some of you not getting the pats on the back. You, 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 nobody's bragging on you. Nobody's thanking you. you. You work yourself silly. You give yourself extensively. And nobody acknowledges it. Nobody gives it. But let me just tell you, I, I know some of you feel like that you are unappreciated and unloved and wondering, when is it going to be your day? One of these days, Jesus is coming. And he's going to reward us. Thank God for that. Verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. That's the blessed hope. C can I just say to you, listen. Jesus is not coming back to do another Calvary. Jesus is not coming back to die for the sins of those that have rejected him already. He's coming back for his bride. He's coming back for his church. He's coming back for those that have truly received him into their heart and into their life. And I'm just sharing with you this morning, if you have not Jesus living in you and you're not in Christ, he is your only option. There are no other means. Only Jesus. And he's coming for his bride. Verse 38, now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. I started out this message this morning by getting you to kind of analyze and to kind of figure out if you're really truly in Christ and Christ is really in you or not. I wonder how many, of, how many folks today can honestly, genuinely, sincerely say with all confidence in Christ, I know that Jesus is my Savior. I know that he lives in my heart and my life. I don't just have a head knowledge of him. He has changed me by his grace and by his power. I've been converted. I've been changed. I am a new creation. Old things passed away and everything became new. I could no longer sin and know it and take pleasure in it and God not whip me for it. I can't stay in sin. It stabs me in my heart and I got to get it right with God. You see, if, if you can sin and keep on sinning, and you don't experience the discipline of God and you don't have remorse about it and you can stay out there without that stabbing in your heart, you have absolutely no reason to believe whatsoever that you're saved. And the Bible says there remains no sacrifice for you. The Holy Spirit's here this morning. And I believe with all of my heart, he's speaking to some of you right now and say, you know what, you've been a pretender You've been a pretender. You've been saying the right stuff. You may have even been doing some of the right things, but you really don't have Jesus. And you need him. I encourage you today, before it's too late, I encourage you, just admit it. Confess it before God. 
and let God do what only He can do through Christ. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.